Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the Azure Days to talk about the Cloud Data Data Platform. Uh, my name is Ram Venkatesh. I'm joined today by Jonathan Shea and Priyank Patel from Cloud Era. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Microsoft for this opportunity to have us present to you about the work that we've been doing with the, the Cloud Era Data Platform, or CDP for short. A little bit of introduction about Cloud Era. So we are, you know, we call ourselves the enterprise data cloud company. So what is that? This is essentially, it's a data platform that lets us you know, enable enterprises to process the entire life cycle of a, of a data set at scale, right? So you can, it starts with the data collection process and ingestion, where you can read in data from uh, a bunch of different sources using technologies like Apache NiFi and Apache Kafka. You can enrich that data through a data engineering experience using uh, conventional SQL tools as well as Apache Spark and machine learning. Once you have these enriched data sets, you can deposit them in the data lake for use by reporting and analytics use cases using SQL and other tools through a data warehousing experience. You can also serve this data out using uh, for point lookups using a key value store like HBase. And finally, it's very, very common for our customers to apply predictive models or machine learning on top of these same data sets. What is interesting and compelling about the Cloudera platform approach to this full lifecycle is that you can do all of these activities in the context of a common security and a governance layer and a function which goes across all of these different steps in that lifecycle. And finally, we offer this platform in a bunch of different form factors. We have a significant deployment of the Cloudera data platforms on-premise, on bare metal and in private cloud configurations, and also increasingly in the public clouds. Right? So this is on, on AWS, on Microsoft Azure, and soon to be on GCP as well. So that's the overall data processing platform that's enabled by Cloudera. Let's look a little bit at use cases where this type of a platform approach is relevant. It all starts with collecting all of the data of interest in a single source. So this is commonly called as a data lake architecture, right? where you might bring in data from a bunch of different sources, from transactional systems, from systems of record, to real-time messaging systems, to your log files and, and other artifacts or exhaust from different enterprise applications that's trying to gather in a common place which represents all of the data in your enterprise, that makes it really convenient for you to find relationships between all of these different data sets in a single location. So that's the data lake. Once you have that on the, on the left-hand side here, you can implement a whole bunch of interesting use cases that can take advantage of access to all of this data. So typically, if you're looking to implement like a customer 360 use case or a you know, full cycle preventive maintenance use case, things of that, that nature, that is where the ability to access lots of different types of data about that particular asset or customer in your enterprise context becomes super useful and compelling. So for our customers, the variety of data sources that they're gonna collect from continues to increase on an annual basis, and the number of use cases that they're gonna bring in to this platform also constantly there's, there's new ones that they discover, right? So the enterprise data cloud is essentially the platform that enables these two to come together. So we provide tools for data collection and data management at scale, and then we provide ways to implement these use cases using a bunch of different processing engines. Part of the, the appeal of this platform is that it lets customers you know, very, very flexibly scale up their data processing needs. That we don't know what engine they might use in the future to process the data that they have today, but with this data lake platform approach, it gives them the flexibility that they're looking for to actually realize that. So that's the core value proposition of the Cloud Data, data Platform and this you know, full cycle approach to, to data processing using this modern data lake architecture. Okay? When you implement this architecture on-prem, typically there you have storage and compute that's co-located on a bunch of physical servers, typically in a Hadoop cluster, and that's where all of your workloads are running. Increasingly, our customers want to migrate these kinds of data processing architectures to the cloud. You know, the conventional wisdom is you've got to think about separating compute and storage. So that's typically the first step in this journey 
where essentially what we've done is we've taken this monolithic architecture in the platform and we separated out the storage layer instead of just being HDFS to now also take advantage of cloud storage and on the compute side to provision virtual machines from the cloud providers on demand as required to perform the computation. So this gives you a certain amount of agility and you, know, you can take advantage of the elasticity of the cloud. It isolates you from other applications, so on and so forth. And this is a very conventional picture for what we call the first generation of you know, big data processing in the cloud. Uh, EMR, HD Insight, Dataproc, all of them implement variations of this architecture. Right? And there are a bunch of use cases where this works pretty well. So if you're, if you're implementing single tenant, single workload use cases, but if you don't have a lot of you know, very, very sensitive data, or if you're not running in a, in a regulated environment, that's quite appropriate, right? But for a number of our customers, security and, and uh, the ability to work with enterprise data is table stakes, right? When you talk about some of the largest uh, pharma companies or healthcare companies or financial services companies or insurance companies, right? Their requirements for a data lake include being able to bring in very, very sensitive data, being able to comply with with the regulatory oversight and auditing requirements that they actually have to have to at all times during this entire processing of the data. So at this point, what typically happens is that data lake picture that I showed you, this simple separation between storage and compute, turns out to be necessary but not sufficient. But some of the other attributes that you need to have in the platform have to do with you know, really strong authentication everywhere, how you think and reason about schemas for your uh, semi-structured and structured data, the kinds of authorization policies that you have in effect, a really comprehensive audit trail, so you know who did what to which data set at which point in time, um, the ability to tag and classify data, the ability to replicate data between environments or between data lakes, uh, the ability to have comprehensive workload and capacity management at scale. And finally, if you think of uh, from, a, from an encryption standpoint, right, encrypting the data at rest, encrypting the data while it's being processed in one of these engines, and also en encrypting the data on the wire. All of these capabilities are table stakes if you want to enable you know, discovery or things of that nature for this enterprise customer base that we serve. So this is the, the problem domain that CDP is directly trying to address. And the way we address this in CDP is essentially through an abstraction layer that we call the shared data experience. Right? So in addition to cloud storage and ADS Gen 2, we augment that with a core set of services around schema, policy, metadata management, and governance called SDX. Right? And now we have different experiences for processing the data that connect to this shared layer and interact with it for all of these common behaviors that we expect from them. So with SDX, this lets us realize an architecture that's really simple, but you can create the data set once and have it be processed by multiple different engines while still having the consistent security experience that you're looking for. This is especially critical since we offer this platform in the same architectural form factor both in private cloud as well as in the public clouds. But at the scale and uh, you know at, at the scale of data processing that typically is appropriate for our customer base, this integration with the cloud provider has to be really, really deep. So this is where CDP and Azure really shines, right? So there's the integration with Azure for CDP can be broken down into four basic tiers, right? At the infra layer, we take advantage of a whole bunch of cloud-native services. We talked about Gen2 a little bit. There's also Azure AD for authentication, the Azure Kubernetes service, unit injection, things of that nature, so that we are truly taking advantage of the enterprise features in Azure. Um, on top of that, right, there's analytics experiences using NIFI, Spark, Kafka, and others, which are both in two form factors. One is the uses Azure VMs, and the other uses the Kubernetes service to orchestrate uh, these experience in minutes in containers. The third layer up from that is consumption, where our SQL experiences and our machine learning experiences have been designed to seamlessly integrate with Microsoft Power BI as well as ML notebooks. Right? And finally, from a, from a data sharing standpoint, our shared data experience is intended to serve the CDP ecosystem really well, but it doesn't stop there. It can be extended out 
to interact robustly with other services like Azure Data Catalog and you know, third-party LOD applications that might be sitting on top of the whole platform. Our goal with CDP is to provide all of these you know, as a managed service operated by Cloudera, but it can be purchased and consumed through the Azure Marketplace. So this marketplace integration essentially enables you know, uh, consolidated billing and consumption for the customer. So with this picture in mind, next we want to actually you know, give you a demo of the platform instead of talking about it. So for that, it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Shea, who's the Director of Product Management with Flavera. He works on our data management team to walk us through what SDX actually looks like in real life. Thanks, Rob. Hi. I'm John Shea, Director of Product Management here at Cloudera. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick tour of CDP's shared data experience, or SDX, in action. First, I'll start off from an IT uh, or platform owner's point of view. Then I'll move on to a data analyst or a data owner's perspective. All right, so let's just get into the product. Um, here is the landing page for CDP. I have logged in here using my corporate identity provider. I use Okta here at Cloudera and I have logged in to the splash page. Now you'll see two main sections here. The first section, the top section is the workloads. Prionk, we'll talk more about these in the next section. These are the data hub clusters, which are VM-based workloads, and then the more modern Kubernetes-based workloads for data engineering, data warehousing, operational database, and machine learning. I'm gonna focus on the control plane and the pieces that are part of SDX, the shared data experience. Now, the control plane has multiple pieces. The data catalog helps you understand your data, and I'll talk about that. I'm going to skip over the replication manager and the workload manager and focus on the management console and talk about some important abstractions that are there uh, and help you understand how we manage the infrastructure for sharing uh, your data and sharing infrastructure. So let's start off with the environments. I'm going to go into the management console and then go into the dashboard. What you'll see here are an abstraction that we call environments. Think of these as data centers or separate data lakes. These pieces of infrastructure help you share the resources. And when you're in this shared data experience, you're sharing data and rules and policies within that environment. Now, as the picture implies, this can be all around the world and it can be on multiple clouds. In this example, we have 28 on Amazon, eight on Azure, and then 19 and four legacy on-prem clusters all linked together by CDP, um, allowing you to have a hybrid cloud workloads. Okay. Now, this is where IT and um, your platform owners are probably going to be focused. Um, next, I'm going to go click on the environments, and we'll see a list of all the different environments that are available. I can register and create new ones with a simple wizard and uh, you know, choose the different settings, choose what region. Uh, these will live in, whether they're in Amazon or whether they're in Azure, and you know, go through this nice little wizard to set that up. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop over to a particular region that I've set up, the uh, SDX East uh, environment running on top of Microsoft Azure. You can see here in this summary page uh, that this is hosted in the US East region. It's got two nodes in the light duty setup. And it's got a couple of things called data hubs in here. These are these VM-based workloads. You can see there's one for data flows or for ingestion using Apache NiFi. Another one that's a data engineering focused uh, data hub focused on Apache Spark and Apache Hive. Next, I'm going to go click on to the data lake. Now, this is where all those shared services, that context piece that Ron was talking about in the slides, this is how this has been instantiated. And what you have here are a series of services that manage uh, your lineage and your security and access policy roles. So that's Apache Atlas and Apache Ranger. You'll also get a lot of technical metadata. Again, this is where the IT folks and the platform folks are probably more interested about uh, different endpoints that are available for APIs, different hardware that's being used in the cloud. If I click on this, it'll open up the Azure page for this particular virtual machine. Um, and other things like cloud storage. Hey, where in ADLS is this actually stored? You have directories here to access this information. So here is basically the, the, the core pieces of infrastructure 
uh, that allow an, a platform owner to uh, you know, put all these rules in one place and set it up so that data consumers can start creating workloads and start consuming the data. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to that next perspective, the perspective of a data analyst or a data owner. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the data catalog. Now, while that previous view was kind of more IT focused, this next view is more focused on data consumption, data searching, and being able to share data with other people. What you have here is a kind of a shopping experience or a search experience. I'm going to look for a particular table based on certain filters. I know it is a SQL table or a Hive table, so I'll filter there. It gives me more facets, and I'm going to say, I just care about the tables that are owned by John, and I care about the tables that belong to the Twitter database. And what this has done is it's narrowed down the set of data assets uh, that meet these criteria so that I can dig in and drill in and find out more information about those particular data assets. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to click into www customers and rich and get the asset 360 view, the detailed view of what this data set is all about. This has some important information. It has what kind of data set it actually is. It's a hive table. It has what database it belongs to. It has the owner or the creator of this particular data set. And most interestingly, it has lineage. It shows how this table was created. If I look at it, Right here is where I currently am, this red node right here. And you can see that there's two different sets of tables that generated this table. I have a bunch of dub dub customers data, and then I have a bunch of tweets and tweet samples that were actually created using one of our ingestion tools. This get Twitter piece is actually Apache NiFi. Clicking on it, I can get more details. And actually clicking on the actual item, I can actually navigate to and see what data sets depended on this Twitter data set. Now I can easily navigate back to this particular uh, data set that I started off on, and I can actually go in the other direction too. I can see what depends on this enriched data set and go to these other things afterwards. And what I've actually gotten to here is now a ML model build. And you can see that beyond just this table, it depends on this other set of tables up here. Now, if I were to dig in and drill in for more details, you would see that this upper branch was actually done via Spark ETL. And this branch below here was done via Hive ETL. Now, this is extremely useful for anybody who has the job of analyzing or engineering data because it helps different teams who like to use different tools understand how they got to the data that they're using or generating reports from or generating models from. So it helps you understand the entire end-to-end -end data lifecycle um, all through this lineage. And it's really helpful for debugging your data pipelines across different teams as uh, you know, your data practice expands. Um, so next, I'm going to take on the data owner perspective. And, and for this section, I'm actually going to uh, segue to a different data set um, around flights. My coworker, Priyank, loves doing analysis and machine learning on flight information. So in this example, I did a search uh, using the faceted search and using the, the search, uh, free text search to find this particular data set. In the next example, I'm going to show you how to search a different way, taking advantage of information uh, crowdsourced or, or socially gathered from your coworkers and other folks that you're uh, interacting with. So here I am on the data catalog search page again, the demo Azure environment. And this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to search on the data sets icon over here. And what this provides is a curated set of um, data sets that uh, people have created. Right? You can almost think of this as Pinterest for your data assets. And I know it's about flights, and there's a flights demo collection. So I'll click on that. And it gives me a list of the assets that John has collected here. And one particular table that is of particular interest to me, flights external. So when I look at this, it looks like it was created by Jay Fletcher. The lineage is a lot simpler than the previous one. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to dive into the details a little bit more here and show you, um, you know, what we can do now that we have all this data shared in SDX. When I click on the schema, I actually can see that the information has things I'd expect in a schema, types, fields. 
but it also has other information like min, max, and number of unique fields. It also summarizes information. This is flight data. And you can see that ORD, Chicago O'Hare, is the most popular airport in this data set, followed by Atlanta and Dallas Fort Worth. Right? So a very quick way to get an idea of what the data is without having to do any queries. But you know, the perspective that I'm talking about here is from a data owner's perspective. And for that, when you share data, you need to be able to control that sharing. And the way we can understand that is by clicking on the Policies tab. We can very quickly look at what policies are being applied to this data set so that we can understand who can view it and who's been accessing it. So here, you can see that there's only resource-based policies. And because this database, because this table belongs to the airline on-time uh, database, it's applied this particular policy on that data. And when I click on it, it'll let me actually see all the details of all the different policies. Or sorry, when I click on it, it'll let me see the details of this particular policy. Uh, here we are. Uh, we can see the particulars of this policy. And you can see that anybody, uh, any table that is in the Airlines on Time Parquet database have these permissions applied. So if you're in the member of public, you have the ability to select, alter, index, lock, all, and read uh, and refresh this particular data. So I mentioned earlier that Preonc really likes uh, the uh, flight information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the audits, and I'll show you that, in fact, Preonc was uh, you know, accessing this data earlier today. And here we are, and uh, you can see that Preonc was last accessing this table um, you know, about half an hour ago. and and working with it, uh, doing some sort of select queries. Right? We can also see other users and other processes who've been talking to this data as well. Now, when I look at these policies, one thing that's great about SDX is the fact that all the security policies and all the audit trails are collected in one place. It is in this uh, Apache Ranger system. And if I go into the resource-based policies, I can give you an idea of you know, what elements are covered by uh, SDX and by Apache Ranger. You can see here a variety of different systems, right? We have HDFS, we have Yarn, we have Atlas, we have HBase, NiFi, uh, we have Hadoop, Solar, et cetera. But one thing that we're particularly proud of that's coming in this very short term is our integration with ADLS. And this ADLS integration allows us to uh, provide fine grained access control and respect Azure ACLs in ADLS. So what that really means is that while I'm data engineering or while I'm creating new data sets in CDP, the files that are created are actually owned by me when I access them from Azure outside of CDP. So we're being good citizens uh, with the other Azure services. So that's actually really exciting and in tech preview today. So I covered a whole bunch of pieces of the SDX or the shared data experience. Uh, I covered how, as a platform owner, you can manage things centrally using environments and control how resources are managed with a unified user interface. Then I went over to the data catalog to show through how one user interface you can go through and search for and find interesting data sets as a data user and understand how your data is used as a data owner and how it's protected through security policies. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Ron. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a really nice demo. I appreciate you going through the all the nitty-gritty of SDX in such a short amount of time. Next up, we want to talk a little bit about the layer above the SDX, the, the different experiences that can be used to process data. So for this, I'd like to invite uh, Priyank Patel, our VP of Product Management, who works on our machine learning stack at Cloudera. Priyank? is going to walk us through a set of use cases that actually use the platform through the lens of these experiences. Welcome, Priyank. Thanks, team, for that good introduction. What I'm going to do next is to walk everybody through the various experiences, which are the various computes uh, that you can run in these shared data lakes that uh, John and Ram talked about. Uh, and to actually talk about it, we'll, we'll look at it from the lens of uh, analyzing some flight uh, uh, cancellation data or flight delay data. Uh, and it's pretty often uh, times that uh, the same data gets uh, requested by multiple teams in an organization. So in this case, 
we have uh, uh, several million records of uh, actual flight cancellations throughout the U.S. Uh, for several years now. Uh, in my scenario, what I'm going to be uh, trying to do is to is to represent a team that is tasked with uh, uh, predicting flight delays, so knowing the past about where uh, cancellations and delays have been. We want to actually talk about what are the potential cancellations coming up by airport, by region, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, there's quite a few uh, different personas involved, the first one being the business intelligence and the SQL analyst. And uh, she needs to get the data real quick to understand uh, to understand how the hist historical patterns have panned out over several years into different regions and, and airports. You know, they have their uh, she has her own uh, business intelligence tooling, and she is pretty proficient in SQL. Uh, all she cares about from a shared uh, compute perspective and a shared data lake is simplicity and a high performance uh, of the experience. But at the same time, you have on the other side a data science team, and the data scientists on the team uh, also need access to the exact same data, the millions of records of, uh, of flight delays, except that their use case is around trying to design a model to predict uh, delays, which means they have a bursty workload that could potentially use CPUs or even GPUs if they want to, uh, if they want to train uh, models using GPUs. And then once they're done with that, they'd like to quickly deploy and monitor these models once they're in production. Uh, turns out that in the middle of these uh, competing uh, demands, sits the administrator or the data lake administrator who is uh, who is serving these multiple workloads, except that it's the same data. So they'd like to ideally reduce the risk and the cost associated with moving data into multiple environments. And of course, while doing uh, while, while reducing that, make sure that they meet the SLA and the ease of use expectations that both the teams are uh, are going to have of them. So let's see how we do this by jumping into a live demo. All right, so here what I have on my browser is uh, I've logged in as myself, as you see on the bottom left over there, into CDP. And I'm looking at uh, the various experiences or the computes that are available, as well as the control plane service and what John talked about earlier with the data catalog and the management console. Uh, I'm going to start out with the first uh, uh, use case where I need to enable the BI analyst. And so I'm going to go into the data warehousing service and get a quick idea about how I can spin up a, a compute uh, warehouse for the BI analyst. When I log in over here, I have an option of looking at the different environments where CDP is actually set up. I'm going to look into the demo Azure environment where uh, John was actually working on, where he had the common uh, data catalog for the flights uh, uh, table. In there, you'll see I have a few database catalogs, as we see. And I could easily set up a new catalog if I wanted. But in this case, I'm actually inheriting the catalog that is stored as part of the environment. So I get automatic access to all the tables and the uh, shared security policies that are already set up. And over here on the absolute right, I, I can now set up different virtual warehouses. So when I wanted to, if I want to set up a new virtual warehouse for this team, I just click on a new warehouse, enter a name. So let's say if I call it Flight Analytics, see over here, I get a choice of whether I need to uh, use Hive or Impala, one of the engines that I want. The catalog is already set up. I select the groups that are uh, that are actually responsible or will be using it. So let's say if I select the product analyst group, and then I select the size of the uh, setup. Let's say in this case, I choose uh, a medium uh, setup. It automatically chooses some uh, options for me, particularly around how quickly or how, how responsive I need my data warehouse to be from the perspective of suspension. This is, uh, this is uh, controlling how quickly uh, uh, the, the uh, service, the managed service, will shut down the underlying instances of Azure in order to save infrastructure uh, costs because I'm an, I'm an administrator, I'm still uh, starting to give out access to uh, these end users, I want to set some guardrails around it. Similarly, there's another guardrail, which is uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, simple to understand, is what is the minimum and the maximum number of nodes that I uh, want to be running uh, my warehouse on. In this case, I chose a minimum of 20. 
that came because I chose a size of medium. I could obviously go completely custom and choose a different uh, set if I want, or I could choose a smaller subset as well. There is further options that I can uh, quickly specify if I, if I, if I, cho if I still chose to in terms of uh, having some extra capacity or uh, selecting the wait time instead of the headroom that would also control the responsiveness that I am willing to uh, provide vis-a-vis -vis the uh, cost saving guardrails that I, I as an IT administrator want to apply to this project. And so these are all settings that I make once and I click on the create button. What that does is it creates a compute warehouse for me. So for example, over here, when I select, there is, and I've set up uh, one in, in advance of our demonstration over here, I have, a, I, have an, I have a high warehouse set up on Azure that I can now uh, open up and start giving access to my analysts. As an analyst, I'll come back, come in and say, first thing, I want to explore the data through SQL. You can open it up into the data uh, analytics studio or DAS or Hue. Let's start with DAS. When I click on it, takes me to this page, automatically logs me in, and I have uh, I can start composing my queries. On the left, I see the databases and the catalog that are part of the uh, data lake. So all of these are available uh, ahead of time. And I have a few queries that are saved up, but imagine if I'm a SQL analyst, I can always obviously start writing my queries uh, right over here with the selects that I care about. Let's say if I go to one of the save queries that I have, just to look at how much uh, data I'm analyzing. In this case, I'm just counting from the flight external table. If you remember, flight external was the table that John uh, had set up in my data catalog earlier as well. Let's say I execute this. What this is doing is it's running the query on that same warehouse. In this case, it's running within the. Uh, it's it's not putting that much uh, that much load that I need to uh, uh, increase the number of nodes that uh, sit behind it. But you can imagine that as more and more of my team members start issuing uh, SQL on it, the data the the warehouse will start uh, uh, auto scaling up and down as needed. Another query, let's say in this case, I'm looking not uh, at about, um, and you will see there somewhere around 86 million records of data. Let's say in this case, I want to start looking at airlines which have the most cancellations. And so another simple SQL query, I'll just run it quickly uh, on it. It'll tell me the top 10 carriers who have had the most canceled flights. And of course, the carrier names that show up according to this data set, right? And so on and so forth. You can imagine how uh, the uh, uh, SQL and the BI uh, analysts would have uh, would would use this as one of their primary interfaces when in, when when working on this data and understanding the uh, patterns that exist in the data. The other use case that uh, that a business intelligence tool uh, or, or business intelligence uh, 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 team would have would be around attaching their favorite BI tool. And so in this case, right from here, from the warehouse that was uh, provisioned, I can obviously take the JDBC uh, URL and set it up into my favorite BI tool. I can, of course, download the JAR file if I have a, uh, if I have a thick client uh, application that I need to use and start moving from, uh, from here to start Issuing queries not by just writing and exploring on my on my, on my uh, query editor, but directly from the drag and drop uh, interfaces. And I'll come back to it uh, 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 with a with a sample dashboard uh, towards the end of our demo as well. So that's how simple it is to take what uh, was defined and secured in the shared lake earlier on and quickly make it available to a group of uh, uh, BI analysts and while keeping, most importantly, the guardrails of cost around it. Let's say the same exact data, and if you remember our use case, our use case is that we want to use the same data to not just talk about uh, uh, data warehouse and BI analysis, but let's do some predictions and try to figure out where the future delays are going to be. And that's where we go into the machine learning experience inside CDP. And again, we're talking about the exact same environment, which is the Azure environment that we've set up, which means it's running on the infrastructure inside the Azure account that has been set up. In this, in this environment, I've set up a workspace. A workspace is essentially uh, this uh, a set of compute that I can set that I can enable. So let's say if I have if I want to make it available for my data science team, I select the environment, my demo is your one environment. 
I select the advanced options. This is where I get a choice of which particular type of CPU nodes that I care about. And you will see the Azure instances that show up over here. Or if I wanted to, I uh, can turn on and off the setting of whether, whether I allow GPUs, but we also support uh, GPU-based uh, data science or machine learning uh, that you can uh, enable your end users for. And, and much the same as how I provisioned a virtual warehouse, I provision a workspace, which is just a set of compute. But the, the key point is that it is inside the exact same environment, which means it will inherit the same data set for me to work with. So let's go into one of the, uh, into this, which I have already set up into this workspace on the environment. And that's the data scientist uh, uh, viewpoint. So here inside Cloud Data Machine Learning, I have a bunch of options that I can play around as a data scientist. You see I've logged in as my uh, uh, single identity user, obviously. And I have a project that I've defined, it's the airline demo project that I, uh, that I talk about. You'll see over here, I'm actually collaborating with other members on my team. So I'm an administrator over here, but I'm also working with Jeff, Santiago, Sean on my team, and they are working on the exact same uh, airline data, which is, uh, an important, uh, which, is, which is an important aspect when I'm trying to do data science. The natural thing that I do over here from the, from the homepage is I, I start looking at all the files that I have and start a new session where I can actually bring up a notebook and I click launch, it'll pull up a notebook inside Cloud Data Machine Learning. This will take a few seconds, but it will schedule the uh, notebook right inside this workspace within the uh, CPUs that were specified. And in this notebook, now I can load up from the files that I've stored any of the ones, that, any of the notebook, any of the IPython notebooks that I'm looking at. So let's say I'm looking at data analysis. I pull up the uh, IPython notebook that I had already uh, 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 built. And here I have the flexibility to start typing up my Python or uh, uh, other uh, or any other language that I that I prefer to use as part of this notebook analysis. The key thing that the data science uh, experience will provide is for a uh, for a data scientist to have uh, direct access to Spark within the notebook itself. So here, for example, you'll see. By default, I already have a Spark session that I can uh, instantiate. I can give it uh, some amount of memory that I care about, the number of executors that I care about. And I've given it a name, Airline Data Exploration, actually, because that's my intent with this data. The next thing that I'll show you is, is and that's the core, is we are actually looking at the same exact data that we were looking from the business intelligence tool or from the SQL analysis that we are going to load up in this notebook. And that's really the key because when we change the persona over from a SQL analyst over to a data scientist, what we did not need to do is to copy the data from a data warehouse into another data scientist uh, friendly tool. And we're using the exact same shared data lake to get that experience uh, or to get that uh, uh, framework working. And then I can uh, I can be as flexible as I want. In this case, I'm just looking at the uh, at, at the data frame um, and looking at uh, analyzing the carriers and the delays that uh, that we're finding. This is just trying to understand the data, cancel it, cancel flight by year, can build up some uh, interesting charts. But this is pretty flexible once I uh, once I get access to the shared data that I that I have stored. So let's go back. Let's uh, go back to the project that I was in. And once I'm done with the building of the model, which I can do with the notebook, I can actually uh, tune my parameters with the experiments. I can run a new experiment that will help me tune my, uh, uh, my or perform hyperparameter tuning on my models, and then eventually deploy the model. So in this case, I've deployed the prediction model that will predict whether an upcoming flight is going to be canceled or not. And the deployed model has, has its own uh, uh, metadata, as you see in the catalog, including the ID, including any other details that we uh, that we have. It will show me the past deployments that the model has been through, where, when, what time it has been deployed, and by whom, as well as it will show me the different builds and the different and the, the monitoring information that we have around it. Now, the last bit is once we've deployed the model, we want to then combine the descriptive analysis of the 86 million cancellations with what the prediction is going to say. And for that, 
I choose Cloudera data visualization and I loaded this up ahead of time. Uh, it is also naturally accessible from within the experience. It runs in the exact same compute of the data warehouse that we have. And in there, I have a in, in there I built a, I built a, uh, an, an an application when I do a launch app. It'll, it'll show me over here. That application is my flight operations app. It's giving me an ops view on the cancellations. The interesting part about this is I have by airline. I'm looking at the blue bar over here, which is the uh, uh, current projection. That means what the data that I've gotten back from the model that I built for the number of cancellations that I expect, as well as view it side by side with what I saw last year which would be a more descriptive dashboard that someone would want to build from a BI perspective. But the idea is that with the exact same uh, interface, we are now able to combine both a historical viewpoint as well as a predictive viewpoint on the same flight data that's, that's inside of a shared data lake and build a view or build an operations dashboard, something similar to what I'm, uh, what I'm showing over here. And I can also obviously build a real-time snapshot of that, which means uh, for a particular airport, let's say if I'm now trying to customize this for an airport, this this shows me for the upcoming flights at an airport, um, and this is doing a live query as you see over here for the upcoming flights at an airport like San Francisco. What are the uh, what what are the uh, projected cancellations that I'm seeing, uh, as well as the actual um, as well as by airline, which are the actual uh, uh, flights that would be or, or the number of flights that would be uh, potentially canceling. Uh, coming back. That's the power uh, of uh, the Cloudera data platform, where within within uh, within the exact same platform, I, as an administrator, am able to serve both my teams, my business intelligence teams, as well as my data scientist teams, and I'm, give, I'm able to give them the ease of use in the tools that they care about, SQL and BI tooling for my data uh, uh, analysts on the on the BI side. And then my data scientists who uh, prefer a notebook uh, and a programmatic interface uh, through Spark, they get the exact same uh, uh, data underneath that is secured through the data catalog and through, uh, that is secured through the SDX and uh, and viewed through the data catalog as we saw. Uh, but that's the that's the real power of the Cloud Data Data Platform is that I have multiple computes and you'll see over here we build out uh, uh, the entire data lifecycle even though we just demonstrated data warehouse and machine learning the entire life cycle through data engineering, uh, serving through key value operational databases, as well as uh, data flow would be uh, would be part and parcel of this uh, shared experience that, uh, that our customers can have. Uh, with that, I will end this uh, part of my demo. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent, thank you, Priyank. That was an awesome demo. I'm amazed that you could go through all of those experiences in such a short period of time. So to recap, Essentially, what we've shown you today is the Cloud Red Data Platform in action. Uh, we showed you the public cloud Azure capabilities of CDP, but it's really a platform which emphasizes the power of AND, right? So it's about giving you consistent experiences, both on-premises and in the public cloud. It's multi-cloud and multi-function, right? It is simple to use, as you have seen, but security is really a cornerstone of how we have actually gone about building CDP. Uh, there are a rich set of user experiences, but there's automation. All of this is built using open source technology. So the underlying file formats, engines, and the code itself is open and extensible. Our goal is to really target a rich diversity of data analysis personas, from data engineers to people who are familiar with SQL to data scientists. Right? So for the entire gamut of such use cases, CDP enables them to be extremely productive. So this brings us to the end of this presentation. Uh, I want to thank you for, for participating in this session and watching this with us today. Uh, if you want to know more about CDP and Cloudera, there are a few online resources that you could uh, go to, as well as you can sign up for a, a trial of CDP at cloudera.com. I really hope you take us up on one of those, and we look forward to hearing from you on that. Other than that, have a nice day with the rest of the sessions at Azure Days. Thank you.